This morning I invite you to stand as you are able. Let us lift our hearts together and pray together our prayer for illumination. <coughs> and to remain standing as you are able out of respect for the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Hear now the reading of God's holy word from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, beginning in the first verse. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken away from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know if you keep up with it or not, but just in case you do, I wanted to tell you. The title in the bulletin was right three weeks ago. It's not right today. Today, the title, I think, should be, if we were going to title this message, would be Between the Bookends. You all know what bookends are, right? Very good. I was hoping we have not gotten so far gone in this digital age that we have not forgotten what bookshelves or bookends are. Today is a day that you and I knew was coming from our very first Sunday together. We did. Unless you have not been Methodist before. And then this, this may shock you. But if, if you've been a part of the Methodist church, whether this congregation or another, then you will know that just as there is a day that we are saying hello, there's also a day when we're saying goodbye. In the Methodist church, we don't wait until everybody gets mad at the preacher for the preacher to leave. Uh, there's a bishop that has a gauge in Birmingham and decides when the time has come. There is no denying that I leave with the strangest mix of emotions, the strangest mix of excitement and sadness. I'm excited about the new ministry and where God is taking me. I'm excited about the new ministry and where God is taking you. I'm excited for this new adventure with my family and our journey of faith together, just as I'm excited for this new faith chapter beginning in the life of this congregation. However, I'm going to be honest, I'm sad that I will not get to be here to be a part of it with you. And I'm sad that as we continue our journeys of faith, that today the road for us forks. Dadeville has become my home and the home of my family. Benjamin and Robin were not too sure about this whole moving thing. Benjamin does not remember when we came to Dadeville. He was barely two years old. Robin was ordered, but she had not been delivered yet. <laughs> Uh, she was born right here in your midst, and, and you are the only church she's ever known. It, and that's really scary. I wrote this down today so I wouldn't get so emotional, but uh, that's really scary because she expects that she's going to be able to take her shoes off and run through the church and color on the walls, and no one's going to get mad at her wherever we go next. And I keep trying to tear this sweet, darling baby girl. That may not be the case. It was at this altar where you received Melissa and Benjamin as one of your own. It was at this font where Robin was baptized. Some of y'all remember that. 
Melissa and I took vows on her behalf and swore before God and you to raise her in a Christian home, leading her in the life of faith so that she would one day be able to take those vows for herself. And you too made a promise to Melissa and I and to Benjamin and Robin that you would surround us with a family of love and grace and help us raise them. And you have. And you've spoiled them. And, and I'm just going to tell you that since you have helped raise them so well, and since some of you have spoiled them so well, don't think that you get off the hook because we're moving. The teenage years are approaching faster than I want to admit, and I know that there is going to be much guidance that I need in raising a little girl who is already four going on 16 and thinks she's a diva, and a boy that is as stubborn as, her, as his mother ever dared be. Uh, I, I know I'm going to have to have some advice from you, as, as well as an afternoon or two spent with Phil on his dock. And, what happens between me and Phil on his dock stays between me and Phil on his dock. This is what makes the day so difficult. It's not simply like leaving a job or changing cities or even graduating from high school or college. The day feels like leaving a part of me behind. You were wounded when I, when I arrived. And you may not know it, but so was I. You have no idea how much God has shown his grace through you to me. You have no idea the hurts and fears that you helped to mend in my life and in my heart and in my soul. You have no idea how close I was to leaving ministry and how you pulled me back from that edge and restored my hope in this thing that we call the church. But today I'm reminded by the writer of Ecclesiastes that there is a time for everything on this earth. Everything is numbered. Everything has an expiration date. From the moment we are born, there is a limit to the days we will live. Each day is being checked off with each new sunrise. But the author of Ecclesiastes refuses to see that as a sorrowful or depressing thought. Rather, the author sees it as a reason to celebrate. Now, I've got to be honest with you. We really don't know who wrote the book, uh, Ecclesiastes. The author is only known as the teacher. Yet... The teacher introduces the book with the words of the teacher, the son of King David, king of Jerusalem. And the author also writes, I, the teacher, when king over Israel in Jerusalem. Which leads many people, myself included, to believe that this book has been written by none other than King Solomon. This passage is well known. Probably the most well known passage from the book. I can't help but imagine that this is in part, not only to the practical advice that it gives in its lovely poetic form. For there was this 1960s rock band called The Birds. Did you ever hear of them? If you didn't, you know their song, Turn, Turn, Turn. Do everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season. Yeah, some of y'all sing along. Guess what? They didn't write that. Solomon did. But they definitely helped to make it popular. Yet the birds, like so many biblical commentators, preachers, and teachers, have missed the point of this passage. So often we focus on only the first eight verses. These verses juxtapose the book's ends of life and life experiences. Notice the dichotomy that's written. There is a time to be born and likewise a time to die. There is a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to laugh and a time to weep, a time to mourn and a time to dance, and so forth. When divorced from verse 9 and following, it seems to paint a pretty grim outlook. Everything we have will come to an end. And there's no arguing that this is true. Everything will have an end just as everything we know in this life had a beginning, all except for the triune God, who had no beginning and who will never have an end. Everything else we know will have an end. But the teacher's point to all of this is discovered in verses 9 through 15. <clears throat> to say that he believes that, yes, there must be an end to everything, an appropriate time for everything is true. But we human beings cannot know these times and appointments. Rather than trying to change what God has done or is doing or worry and fret about what we cannot know or control or mourn and withdraw at the passing of a season, we should celebrate, give thanks, and enjoy ourselves and each other. We should eat, drink, take joy in our work, fellowship, share, love, laugh, and be grateful. As I have read somewhere that someone more poetic than I have written, do not cry because the song is over, rather celebrate the opportunity that we had to dance. Now, this is not the same notion as that ancient Greek Epicurean philosophical idea of eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. Rather than being a morbid reminder of all things ending, it's a call to rejoice. Because we don't know the hours, the days, or the times of the seasons of our lives, but we know God, and God does know. It reminds me of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he uh, preaches to the crowd that is gathered, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? 
Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grasses of the field, which is alive today and thrown into the, the oven tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear, or who's been appointed? For it is the Gentiles who strive for these things. I added that last part. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It's easy to get caught up in the endings and the beginning of our lives without giving much attention to the most important aspect. The stuff that comes in the middle. The stuff that is found between the beginning and the end. That's where life is lived. The glory, excitement, and adventure of a trip is not finally arriving at the destination, but the journey that takes place along the way. I'm not going to ask you how many of you are in college or ever been to college. I'm, never, I'm not going to ask you how many of you have ever been on a road trip because some of you are married now, and I really don't want to cause a fight. I will tell you I have been on a road trip. I've been on a couple of them. We took a road trip somewhere and didn't even know where we were going. Not because we didn't got lost, but because it was one evening, Tuesday of spring break. I was sitting around with some of my fraternity brothers and none of us had anything to do. And they said, hey, let's go for a drive. I said, hey, that's a great idea. Next thing I know, we're turning around at the Canadian border. The joy of the journey was found in the journey itself. Not where we started from or where we ended. That's what we tend to overlook. That's what we miss at some of the most important life choices we make. For example, we focus so much on planning the perfect wedding that by the way it looks and the money that is spent, we seem to put more emphasis on the dress, the decorations, and the food than we do on the realization of what it will take to make the marriage last and have a marriage that is truly God-honoring as God intended with love, honor, and cherishing each other for better or for worse till death us do part. We forget the wedding ceremony does not constitute what the marriage will be. It only celebrates its beginning. Or consider our baptisms, confirmations, professions of faith. They're not the culmination of our faith, sealing us in some heavenly, holy isolation at the pinnacle of the Christian life. Rather, baptism, confirmation, our profession of faith, they mark the beginning of our faith journey. We can get so caught up in the what-ifs. The fears, the unknowns, the doubts, the gossip, the change, the travel, that we miss the journey, the opportunities, the fellowship, and the new beginnings that are always all around us because of God's abundant blessings to us. I say all of this in an attempt to describe just what the teacher of Ecclesiastes wants us to stop and consider. All of life's chapters have a beginning and an end. We cannot become so consumed with the joy of a beginning that we create expectations that no journey can possibly provide. Nor can we become so emotional about an end that we negate the joy of the journey we have experienced and the blessings that God is about to newly pour out. We've journeyed a long way together in four and a half years. Some of the ways were happy and fun. Some were sad and painful. Sometimes we got along. Sometimes we didn't. Sometimes you were hurt. Sometimes I was hurt. I'm sorry for those times. But you know what? That's a part of life in a family. When we can be real with each other and share our hearts and our souls. It's all of this together that makes the journey. It's all of these experiences together that help us grow. And personally, I count them all a joy. So today, let's try to take the words of the teacher to heart. Let's celebrate, give thanks, enjoy ourselves and each other. Let us each drink, take joy in our work, fellowship, share, love, laugh, and be grateful. Not because, well, tomorrow we're all going to die. But because, well, we do not know the times or the seasons of our lives, and we cannot control all that tomorrow holds, and worry produces no fruitful thing. Yet we know the one who holds tomorrow, who speaks to calm the seas, and has plans to give us a future with hope. We have a living God who continues to call us, equip us, send us, surprise us, and most of all, a God that is stuck on this journey with us. Emmanuel, God with us, who refuses to let us go. And this God, our God, does know the seasons. And because God knows, we celebrate. 
Everything has a time. Much like the reading of a really good book. A great story can't be told on page one and concluded on page two. I know. I tried in 10th grade in a book report. It didn't work. The story is developed and experienced in the pages found between the first and the last. The same is true with our lives. Life is not lived only on the first page, it's simply moving to the last. We live. We experience life in the pages that fill our stories between the first and final chapters. We live between the bookends, as that is where the great story of our lives is being told. Yet, just as with a great novel, we cannot begin another chapter until we conclude the one we are on. And the great good news is our God is the great author who's always writing. Everything has a time. May we find joy and blessing in living life between these bookends. In the name of the great author, God the Father, the Creator, Christ the Son, the Word made flesh, and God the Holy Spirit, the one who reads to us. In the name of God who called us together and now calls us apart. Goodbye. Amen.